Hi, this is Dark Journalist. Today we're excited to welcome back Dr. Joseph P. Farrell, the author of the influential Giza Death Star book series. His latest book, The Third Way, is causing quite a stir with its investigation of the CERN Hadron Collider, ostensibly the most complex facility ever built for a particle accelerator to do advanced physics experiments, but which Dr. Farrell theorizes was built for a far more sinister purpose. Now, Dr. Farrell traces the development of this modern mystery to an obscure set of experiments by a post-war Nazi international that even today exerts a powerful influence on something as public as the European Union. We're going deep into the deep political state today to find out the truth on this, and we may not like what we find. Here we go. Dr. Joseph Farrell, CERN, Paperclip Nazis, and the Cosmology Cartel. By creating a machine that is so expensive and so unique, most people in the scientific community, when you get them off record, are willing to admit that this has huge potential military implications. You've got counter-rotation in magnetic fields that are 15,000 times the local field strength of the magnetic field of the Earth. You cannot tell me in that kind of open system physics that this does not have a planetary effect and can have a planetary effect. And now people are looking at this and documenting. You know, sometimes the greatest mysteries and covert operations are found to be hiding in plain sight. The massive particle accelerator and so-called atom smasher in Geneva called the CERN-Hadron Collider may in fact be such a project. Now, I want to say right off the bat that I know that there's been a lot of wild talk and speculation about CERN out there that can't be substantiated, which is why we have Oxford scholar Dr. Joseph P. Farrell here with us today, who's done his own investigation with some shocking implications. This is not some flat earth adult fairy tale. This is serious business. Billions of dollars are being spent on it, but what is it? Let's go find out. Dark journalist will go there. The deepest issues, the hardest stories, the biggest secrets. The truth is never easy. With top guests like former assistant housing secretary Catherine Austin Fitz. Catherine, who is really behind this media censorship? And internet feeds go through satellites. Who controls the satellites? It's the Pentagon. Legendary investigator Graham Hancock. Uh, Graham, this cataclysm must have destroyed an advanced culture in our ancient past. Uh, it truly was an extinction level event. It was accompanied by massive animal extinctions. It was accompanied by huge and unexplained sea level rises and then a sudden plunge of global temperatures. Best selling author Jim Mars. Jim, don't these elite corporate owners need us around to buy their GMO food? Why would they want to depopulate? because they are eugenicists and they believe that they need to purify the human race. And if that sounds like the Nazis, that's exactly what it is. Coast to Coast AM investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, how are we going to scale that wall of UFO secrecy? Humans themselves are bypassing, are beginning to dismiss all of the policies of denial and lies. Dark journalists will go there. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special winter discount available for just $39 for one full year. You'll not only receive access to the complete audio archives to stream or download at your convenience, you'll also get exclusive subscriber-only content and Dark Journalist event discounts. Sign up for our free newsletter to stay updated on the latest shows. Dark Journalist. Let's get the real story in 2016. You know, we need Dark Journalists, so just keep doing what you're doing. Joseph, it's great to have you back on the show, and I've said about your new book that it's outstanding, and it's actually three books in one, because we have those strange connections of CERN to this cosmology cartel, mm -hmm. and we've got the enigmatic post-war Nazi international underground that's resurfacing now through the European Union. Yes. And then we have the deep politics trail going through FDR, uh, up through Senator McCarthy, and ultimately the JFK assassination, all the way to the reunification of Germany. Now, with all that in mind, I want to start here with a figure who has ties to all of this, and that's John J. McCloy. 
Now, we're going to do a complete section on him in a little bit, but for now, let's just say he was the chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mm -hmm. He was the U.S. High Commissioner in Germany after World War II, where he processed many former Nazis not to stand trial. And he also was a member and sitting on the Warren Commission. Yes. Now, beyond that, he also has a credit, which I found intriguing that you've pointed out, which is that he somehow was involved with the setting up of CERN. <laughs> now, how does all that work? Okay, CERN, his association works through a fellow by the name of Dr. Walter Hallstein, all right? Hallstein was a German jurist, uh, a professor of law, uh, at, I think at the University of Rostock. I'm not, I'm not exactly certain where, but Hallstein was one of the big Nazi legal gurus that was involved in the planning of a European Union from the standpoint of how are we going to amalgamate each country's laws and particularly their patent law, <laughs> I might add. Oh, yeah. You know, and create a, a workable European Federation. So Hallstein's approach is very interesting to watch as it unfolds because Hallstein took the view that you could rather than rely on national legislatures to formally change the law. The way you would do it is by the interpretation of the law given by each national bureaucracy. So what he wanted to do was create a European-wide bureaucracy that's going to interpret all of this body of, of jurisprudence, all right? Mm -hmm. Hallstein was also, as far as I know, I've not been able to determine this with any real degree of hard uh, data. So it's my suspicion that Hallstein and people like him were involved with the German-Italian uh, Legal Coordination Committee after Italy joins the Axis. Both countries set up a committee to coordinate German and Italian law in order to create this European-wide federation. So you had German lawyers, you had Italian lawyers trying to sit down and figure out how they're going to, to amalgamate each system's system of, of jurisprudence. So Hallstein is, is this type of figure. Now, after the war, what does Hallstein do? Well, in addition to having theorized all of this stuff for the Nazis, he becomes one of the eminence grises for the post-war German chancellors, all the way from Adenauer to Willy Brandt, all right? They, they've all got Hallstein in there somewhere, okay? You'll, you'll see pictures of all these post-war chancellors, Adenauer with Hallstein, um, Kurt Georg Kiesinger, a member of Joseph Goebbels' propaganda ministry, I might add, with Hallstein. Uh, Ludwig Erhardt with Hallstein. Willy Brandt with Hallstein. You know, every oh. chancellor from the political right and the left, there's Walter Hallstein. Okay. Hallstein is one of the people, when CERN is set up in the post war European common market between Germany and France and, and some other countries. Hallstein is one of the signatories for Germany, and he's one of the movers and shakers setting up this international European nuclear research organization. Why? Well, again, it's the German pattern. If you're prohibited by treaty from any sort of atomic or nuclear work on German soil, what do you do? Well, you internationalize it. It's the cartel solution all over again. Right. You know, and this is this again is the typically Nazi interwar German approach. If if you are in doubt about technology, set up a cartel and get it by licenses, you know. Uh -huh. And this is what they do. They set up CERN as an international sovereign. People people need to understand this as an international sovereign entity to conduct nuclear research. So it's not just a corporation. It has a certain limited sovereignty of its own, kind of like the Bank of International Settlements. And Hallstein is right there with Conrad Adenauer putting his signature on the Treaty of Rome that's going to create this monster. Huh. Okay? And Hallstein is one of the people cleared by John J. McCloy. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's your connection. Yeah, there he is. That's fascinating. And, of course, the CERN-Hadron Collider is a real mystery in many ways. Now, you've done some great research on it in the new book, and I think you're giving us a glimpse of what it really is. 
But one of the things I found particularly intriguing is that you believe that possibly, in relation to the Hadron Collider, the physics part may be a front, and that it was built actually yeah. for something else. We're told we're told that this is all a grand, huge experiment for particle physics, and at that public level, it is. That's what it's about. All right. But when I look at when I look at CERN, there are three very different data sets that convince me that there is something else going on here, folks. The first is the enormous cost of this machine. Uh, it, it cost about, by some estimates, six billion dollars. So in other words, this thing costs three times more than the Manhattan Project, all right? Right. The expenditure, in other words, is on a military scale. That's what I think is, is key here. And they have created a machine, quite literally, which has never been built before. There are components, the detectors in particular, are, if you, if you read about them and study them, these are just, they really are marvels of technology and materials engineering. These things are just incredibly complex machines. They're, they're basically cameras, very sophisticated cameras, to take pictures of particle collisions. That's what they're, they're designed to do. Yes. Uh, the, the enormous cost tells me, first of all, and, and the fact that this was an international consortium, and we don't know, this, CERN is not telling us who built all of this stuff. Huh. Try and find out who built all of this stuff. You know, that's a mystery in itself. Every now and then, you'll hear about this little company in Canada or that little country a company in Switzerland, you know, or this little factory in Russia. Everybody's building for CERN, you know, some little component. It's the big picture that you're not told, and they aren't telling, okay? Yeah. Okay, that's the first level. The second level is the data. What people don't understand is that the reason we have a public internet right now is because of this project and CERN. Why? Because if you look at when the internet goes online and why, it's because of CERN. They're using the internet or then the world wide web to funnel all of this data from their collision experiments to all these scientific teams all over the world. And you've pointed out that the CERN Hadron Collider actually utilizes most of the bandwidth of the internet. They are in fact the biggest user. Absolutely. Absolutely. The biggest user of the internet is CERN. They are absolutely by far and away the biggest user of the internet. That's CERN. What do you think we need to understand in general about this project to get a handle on what it's all about? What people have to understand is the vast amount of data that the public particle physics story is generating. Because within one second, each collision is generating billions of bits of data in one second. Okay. So take all of those collisions and magnify them now to the scale of a year. So in other words, CERN has to have a gigantic computational capability far beyond what we've been told is sitting there in, in Geneva. Absolutely. This is being farmed out all over the world. Now, when you're generating all of these collisions, the other thing that you must have is computer algorithms that will begin to sort through all of this amount of data and pull the collisions that seem to have the interest for the particle physics scientists to, to look at. So in other words, inbuilt into this system is a system of computer filters. It's the computer, in other words, that first looks at the data and pulls what data to look at. I see. Now, once you've said that, you have admitted the possibility that there is a second system of filters pulling anomalous data that may have nothing whatsoever to do with particle physics and send it to secret teams of scientists. And if we are talking of a computer data experiment and management uh, system on that scale, I suspect that one of the things that they're going to be running as a secret experiment 
is what I call data correlation experiments. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if we turn on our collider at X number of tera electron volts, is there going to be a noticeable effect in the planetary magnetosphere? Are there going to be effects that occur simultaneously with the sun? Are there going to be behavioral uh, changes amongst the human population in the area and so on and so forth? In other words, the idea that you create filters means that you could have a second system of filters where you're running a very different set of experiments altogether, gathering other kinds of data, not even related to particle physics, all right? Right. Now, the third level, the reason I'm suggesting the second level is when we get finally to the third level, and that's the physics itself. Because when you look at the, the collider, the Hadron Collider is the last of five particle accelerators. It's the big 27-kilometer circumference ring, all right? The step before that is a proton synchrotron accelerator of about six uh, kilometers circumference that sits above the Hadron Collider, which is far below ground, about 100 meters below ground. Then above it, at about 25 meters below ground, you have a much smaller circular track, the, the proton synchrotron, which is the final stage of injection of the proton stream into the Hadron Collider. And in the Hadron Collider, let's remember, you've got a proton stream that is running in counter-rotated directions, and that's what creates the collision. All right, so... That means you've got magnetic fields in the Hadron Collider that are spinning things in opposite direction, okay, in a huge track. Now, does that counter-rotation in the magnetic field begin to ring a bell? <laughs> <laughs> as in okay. the bell. As in, as in the bell. You the know, Nazi bell created, project. You've created a huge system, you know, dwarfing the bell, dwarfing it. And above it, you've got yet another collider that's injecting the protons, also rotating the protons, and it's canted off the axis of rotation of the large Cadron Collider. So it's kind of, if I were to draw a circle here with my hand, if you brought the proton synchrotron down, it would sit on the edge, well you can't see it too well, it would sit like that on the edge of the Hadron Collider, and that's rotating. So in other words, I'm looking at all this, and I'm thinking, okay, with my with my little junior high school physics, you know, hack from South Dakota approach to this, I'm thinking, okay, you've got counter-rotation in magnetic fields that are 15,000 times the local field strength of the magnetic field of the Earth. Fascinating. And on top of this, you've got another one with its own strong magnetic fields, that could create a precessional wobble in the magnetic fields. Huh. So in other words, the possibility exists that you have here a machine that is manipulating magnetic fields on a planetary scale that has nothing to do with particle physics. Yeah. And the reason this intrigues me, you know, I, I looked at this and I said, there's no way that they can tell us that this is not going to have a planetary effect. Because what is the Earth's magnetic field generated by? A, a molten iron nickel core rotating in the center of the Earth like a big, huge electric dynamo, creating this big, huge magnetic field, all right? And you're sticking a machine that has a local field strength at one point on the surface of the Earth, 15,000 times stronger than that of the entire planet. And you cannot tell me in an open systems physics where resonance effects from electrical circuits and magnetic fields bleed over into other uh, circuits. I mean, just think of static when you have sunspots, if you're listening to the radio. You cannot tell me in that kind of open system physics, that this does not have a planetary effect and can have a planetary effect. And now people are looking at this and documenting. Interesting. So this is why I think there's a hidden level to this machine having nothing whatsoever to do with particle physics. What that machine looks like to me is a great, big, huge torsion machine. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it looks like. And, you know, I'll stick with it. You can, all you scientists out there can send me blizzards of equations and prove me wrong. And I'm sorry, you know, this is what I think it is. Well, the official story that the CERN Hadron Collider was set up to get this particle physics data by smashing these atoms together and discovering the God particle and that kind of thing is a pretty good cover story. Sure. 
one thing you've pointed out that I find absolutely fascinating about this is that now other major countries want to build their own collider. Yes. And that supports the idea that we may be looking at something much deeper than just a particle physics experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's look at this from simply an epistemological point of view. Okay. Okay. If you're a scientist, the essence of science is the reduplicability of an experiment. So how do you and I take all these particle physicists with their blizzards of equations that even they don't really understand? How do you and I reduplicate an effect? Well, we can't go out and build our own collider. Mm -hmm. But if you're beginning, let's say, let's say for the sake of argument, there, there are a few scientists out there who question the findings of the discovery of the Higgs. And indeed, there have been scientists questioning the, whether or not they really did indeed discover it. So what do you do if you begin to suspect that what you're being told has an odor to it? Well, you have to build your own collider and do your own experiments like China wants to do. Right. <laughs> okay. So I suspect that the very fact that you have, number one, at the public level, a, an epistemological difficulty is why you see these countries wanting to build their collider. But now let's go to the deeper level. Let's assume that I'm right and that there are secret filters in those computer algorithms funneling off data to secret teams of science, scientists looking not at particle physics but at a completely different set of physics, mm -hmm. at torsion effects, at data correlation experiment um, experiments that are being run when the colliders turned on do we notice changes in the earth's magnetic field do we notice changes in the sun do we notice changes in the ambient energy output of other planets in the solar system do we notice changes in the uh, environmental impact on the earth do we notice changes in gross aggregate human behavior okay all of this would be part in my mind <clears throat> of these data correlation experiments well, again, if you suspect something like this may be going on with CERN, then the only way to, to achieve a similar level of knowledge is to build your own and run your own experiments. Right. So I think you have two arguments, really, in place now for why these other countries are going after their own colliders, their own big colliders. Yeah. Uh, they want they, – they, my suspicion is they smell something and they know something's up and that's why they're building their own. And if they suspect for a moment, if they suspect for a moment that the basic physics concepts that I've outlined, that this is a gigantic, huge torsion experiment machine, the cover story being particle physics, if they suspect for a moment that that's the case, then they know that this has huge potential military implications. They've got to have their own. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some interesting voices raised early on that made some strong points, even in the scientific community, that CERN was developing something called strangelets, and that these strangelets could pose a real danger for life here on Earth. Yes. And that it had horrible ramifications, potentially, and that it really should be looked into in a much deeper fashion. Yes. Now, how legitimate do you think that some of those warnings were? Well, they were legitimate because CERN itself acknowledged them. <clears throat> But CERN itself said that the chances of it doing that statistically were vanishingly small, and they are. Uh, it would be far more likely that you'd get, pardon me, strangelet production from something like the collider at, at Brookhaven than you would from the LHC. I see. But nonetheless, <clears throat> you had a bunch of people saying that you could produce strangelets. And strangelets, to, give, to, to, to explain kind of why there was this concern, Strangelets would be the particle physics equivalent of gray goo in nanotechnology. Right. In other words, gray goo is a nanotechnology that is programmed to go out and convert everything it comes in contact with into a gray goo. So eventually, all life, everything on this planet is reduced to a gray goo. Well, a strangelet behaves in a similar fashion. Any matter coming in contact with it is converted into what's called the quark gluon plasma. So you, you, you get kind of a particle of phys physics equivalent of gray goo. So once you've created it, slowly it begins to grow and accrete as more and more 
matter that it comes in contact with is converted into this strange or quark gluon plasma until you end up with a small planetary star, essentially. Okay, so that was the, that was the fear, and there were attempts in Germany and this country to in court actions to shut the thing down to to prevent it being turned off, and that's where the sovereignty of CERN came in, because national courts of course, had no jurisdiction over an internationally sovereign entity. So in other words, if you're going to shut it down, you'd have to go to CERN and say, set up a court so that we can sue you. Oh, tricky. <laughs> well, it sounds like the BIS. The it Bank sounds like the BIS. Yeah, it's Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what it is. Uh, and, you know, yeah, and the, absolutely. Let's face it, the Germans are the biggest backers of the thing. So, you know, we're back to them again. And that all makes me think of this entity you've described as a cosmology cartel mm -hmm. in the Third Wave book. Now, how does that figure into this, and who are they? Well, the cosmology cartel is precisely CERN. Okay. Now, at one level. But what I also mean by it is by creating a machine that is so expensive and so unique and doing such arcane experiments, you have set up an entity which can preside like, you know, the, the College of Cardinals over the, the application and interpretation of all quantum physics data having to deal with cosmological origins. That is a, as a religious institution and as a, a student of religion, that is an enormous thing to admit has been created you've created a kind of, of particle physics vatican that has the imprimatur and nihil obstat on everything in particle physics and that is a dangerous position for anything claiming to be a science to be in and i think it's that epistemological point alone which is leading some countries now to say we need to have our own collider yeah. We need to have an independent means of verification of their pronouncements and, if necessary, an independent means to challenge them. Right. Absolutely. You know, it's so interesting to consider also the kind of entrainment that's been set up around this. Uh, you and I recently did a conference together and we discussed how these scientists, when they talk about CERN, you know, make it sound like the second coming or something. It's yes. just the most flowery language of yes. what a wonderful advance for humanity and these glowing kind of cult-like tributes flowing forward from them. And that really does lead us into the religious question of CERN. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I took pains in the book to cite one such scientist and his language about the collider is ecstatic. It's like he's looking at the Cathedral of Chartres and having... <laughs> you know, either having sexual orgasms or mystical visions or both at the same time. I mean, it, it, he's just going on and on and on about what a wonderful thing this is. But in the process, what he's telling you is we're setting up a cosmology cartel. Oh, right. We're setting up, we're setting up a physics Vatican. Exactly. And, you know, um, that's not a good thing for science. So, again, on an epistemological basis alone, you, you need to have yet another, at least one other non-CERN-related accelerator to verify that, yeah, what they're finding is, in fact, true. But like I say, you've got that deeper level, which I suspect most people in the scientific community, when you get them off record, are willing to admit. This thing is a huge torsion machine. It's coupled to the planet. It's coupled to the – it is having an effect on the planetary magnetosphere. That, in turn, means that by resonance, you might be able to in, induce effects in the sun. Um, you know, this is a huge project. And, and if you're a nation suspecting that it has those kinds of potentials, and you have the ability to make one yourself, you're going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And the dangerous hazards really need a deep, thorough investigation. Yep, absolutely. You know, I'm glad you've gone into this research so deeply, and I think you've extracted some fascinating material. Of course, we're hearing all kinds of intriguing stories now about CERN, you know, some discussing the scientific dangers, others about dimensional doorways, and all kinds of interesting things, but there's no doubt that the strange lit controversy and some of the court cases around that 
were a strong red flag. Right. And I think the fact that it forced some of the officials at CERN to respond and admit that there were dangers, there were hazards involved, even if the odds were not significant, I think it's evident uh, that it should be investigated. And the surprising thing for me is the fact that they've been able to kick this story down. And I think that shows really that they have a lot to hide. Well, they've been able to kick it down because they are um, – you notice a very interesting thing in the physics community, and I find it to be very disturbing. Physicists never stop to, to make pronouncements about religion, and half the time they're as wacky as all get out. I mean, they're, they're so theologically ill-informed, it boggles the imagination. But, you know, if they can do that, then we amateurs can look at their machine and say, okay, this is your story, but with, you know, with our uh, approach to it, you could equally argue, and I think successfully, that this is some sort of huge torsion machine, that it's a, it's a machine designed to have planetary effects. It is designed to manipulate things on a, if you will, cosmological scale, uh, even by the particle physics explanation, it's doing this. So not looking at particle physics, but just looking at its potential magnetosphere effects, which some people are cluing into. Yeah, you're dealing with a very, very different physics than particle physics here. So I think you have to, you, you have to find, um, and I think eventually there will be scientists that will come out and, and acknowledge that, you know, there's more going on here than meets the eye, and it ain't particle physics. Right, right. Well, there's no question there's a hidden aspect to what they're doing. I guess to round out the picture here on CERN, you know, on one level, the collider reminds me of your research into the Nazi physics experiments, like the Bell, that they had hoped would make them, you know, this master race. And the Bell, in fact, looks like an early version of the Hadron Collider, Counter interestingly enough. Yeah. Now, when we think about the Nazi mythology and where they were coming from, if we take them out of the context of their state and military function and bring more of their, you know, kind of cosmology into focus. The super race, you know, even the extraterrestrial origins that they attributed to themselves, mm -hmm. some of these concepts, it strikes me that CERN would be something that would be very attractive to their point of view. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And there's Walter Hallstein signing his, you know, hey, you betcha, you got it. You know, I, I make the joke. Years and years ago, I made the joke in one of my interviews, I forget with who, it may have been George Ann Hughes, God bless her. Oh, yes. That, um, you know. Those are excellent shows. Yeah, they really are. And, you know, I make the joke that if you're somebody like Walter Gerlach, whose total bag in physics is dealing with rotating systems, magnetics, spin, gravity, and all of this stuff. And along comes the Nazis. You know, you're, you've got about as much interest in their whacked out, kooky ideology as you can. So how do you sell your project to them? Well, you go to Himmler and you say, but Herr Reichsführer, the physics that we're talking about is right there on your armband. It's right there in the swastika logo. Mm. Because if you look at the swastika as a vector diagram, if you look at it with the eyes of a physicist like Gerlach, what do you see? Well, you see a subsystem of rotation, the outer arms of the swastika, and then you see a subsystem of stress, the inner arms, with the vectors all pointing inward. So you've got a rotational stress in the medium. And voila, you know, Gerlach can say to, to Herr Himmler, there it is right there, Herr Reichsführer, you know, give us the money, we'll keep investigating this. And to a nut like Himmler, who hasn't got a clue about anything other than chicken farming and killing Jews, you know, this is a wonderful idea. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, it's so interesting what you said about that swastika, though. That symbol, if we research its origins, had that esoteric meaning, and the Nazis unfortunately appropriated it. Absolutely. But there's no question it is a physics yep. symbol, and uh, that's something that you've pointed yes, out. Yes, it is. It is. It is a physics symbol. Yeah. So, you know, I think... I think that's that's a possible reason that you may have some hidden influences going on at CERN that probably the majority of scientists at CERN aren't even aware of. It's that suspicious link to Adenauer and Hallstein and to the whole Nazi plan to create a 
European German led federation with all the kooky ideas that the Nazis had going on in their head that makes me stop and think there's yet another tiny indicator that all is not as CERN would be telling us it is. Um, and again, you know, I may sound like I'm promoting a wild conspiracy theory here, but trust me, you go online and read some of the conspiracy theories about CERN, and I'm I'm vanilla pudding compared <laughs> to uh, you know uh, c compared to some of it. Sure. Well, I'd say that so much of the information around CERN, you know, versus your research in the context of the post-war Nazi international, the secrecy we see in global financial circles, and the hidden technology that you focused on in your work and in your book series, we can see a huge foundation for understanding this Hadron Collider project. And that's very different from just the typical internet rumors that we get all the time about CERN. You know, you do a much better job of supporting your ideas with real evidence and context. Uh, I think there's enough data out there now that people are beginning to compile about disturbances in the magnetosphere of the earth when that thing has been turned on right that begin to corroborate that approach to to the machine i agree i agree and i think uh, that we're seeing in this research you're doing on it a doorway into a level of understanding you know what it's for and what's really behind these experiments and that goes a lot further than just you know the kind of typical stuff we see on the internet well, you know, it's always, in the final analysis, it's always up to each individual to determine, you know, for themselves, with their own mind. I used to tell my students, trust your own mind. Uh, don't trust PhDs with theology degrees or that are going to throw a blizzard of mathematics at you and say, well, you can't understand this, but there's the proof. You know, well, that's not an argument. You know, that's simply an assertion of authority. Mm -hmm. um, so use your own mind uh, and, and think about it for yourselves. Well, that's great advice, actually. So um, let's go deeper now on this path to what may be lurking behind some of the things we've been discussing. Now, of course, uh, when I thought of CERN in the context of your work on the post-war Nazi international, as you lay it out in the book, I started to imagine and you know envision that whole Nazi mythology and the links to the Hadron Collider and the character that jumped out at me was the guy we started the episode off with, and that's John J. McCloy. And now let's go into him a bit. He was an American lawyer for I.G. Farben, mm -hmm. <laughs> and just a fascinating history. Uh, as yeah. years went by, his connections got stranger and more intriguing. Well, McCloy, you know, McCloy is another one of these we movers and shakers, a wheeler dealer. Uh, John J. McCloy was the American counsel for the American branch of IG Farben. So in other words, this guy is plugged into the very pinnacle of, of the German military industrial complex. Okay. And incidentally, I, I'm of the opinion that when Eisenhower gave his military industrial complex speech, that he wasn't just talking about the American one. He was talking about the German one. Mm -hmm. Because the model has been taken over and duplicated here. We're duplicating what was done in the Weimar Republic in Nazi Germany. Okay, that, That's why he warned about the spiritual consequences. Right. McCloy is plugged into this. So McCloy, in that capacity, actually shares Adolf Hitler's box as a personal guest of A.H. himself at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Wow. Okay. Now, that should raise a little flag of suspicion when you have this guy ending up as the American High Commissioner for post-war Germany. Yeah. Okay. This is the guy in charge of vetting all of those cases of Nazis. And what does he do? Well, he conveniently pardons not seven, not 70, not 700, not 7,000, but 70,000. <laughs> oh, that's a huge um, number. It's a huge number. And these, in turn, end up being rolled into positions of federal and state government authority 
under Chancellor Adenauer. Okay, I mean you can look at Adenauer's government and it's Nazi after Nazi after Nazi. Okay, oh, they're back in power with the new regime. They're back. They're back in power. Yes, essentially. Right. And the, it, 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 conveniently, you know, they'll stage every now and then they'll stage a little coup, and then shut it down. Uh, one of the most interesting is the Nauman coup in the 1950s. And, you know, again, Adenauer, another snake, is just pulling fast ones right and left. It's Adenauer's government. We need to remember that when the CIA overthrows King Farouk in Egypt, well, the boots on the ground, as I pointed out over and over again, are Nazis. And Adenauer's government then begins all these negotiations with Gamal Abdel Nasser, to, you know, build rockets for them. He sends Hjalmar Schacht, of all people, to Egypt. To, you know, when Schacht shows up, you know you're dealing with, you know you're dealing with some really... Oh, you're at the Nazi core Yeah, you're right at there. the Nazi core right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, Adenauer's government is deeply involved with all of that. And, it, you know, let's talk about Iran for a moment while we're talking about McCloy. You have the overthrow by the CIA, again, I'm putting quotation marks around it, of Mossadegh in Iran in 1953-54. Now, do you want to reveal what the quotes refer to? It's something else besides the CIA. Well, of course it is. It's, the boots on the ground are the Nazis. Right. Again, you know, it's, it's CIA is saying, oh yeah, go do this. And, and the Nazis are sure, you know, <laughs> because why? Well, after this happens, you have, you know, all of the West German Iranian contacts, business contacts being built up. And that includes, oh, yeah, we'll sell you a few uranium enrichment centrifuges in, in the works, too. You know, so it's not just the Russians selling Iran nuclear technology. Once again, it's the Germans, you know. Um, the, folks, what I'm trying to get at here is Germany is is one of the driving forces behind nuclear proliferation in the world. Uh, they are selling the technology. Uh, they, they clearly have accessed the entire fuel cycle uh, long ago. I mean, it, it, by the late 1950s, early 1960s, Germany had closed the fuel cycle, were perfectly capable of building a bomb, assembling a bomb in a couple of weeks if they wanted to. Uh, they've used proxies like South Africa to test them. So we're dealing, like it or not, with a de facto nuclear and, I would add, thermonuclear power, the hydrogen bomb, the big one. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're fully capable of doing this. I believe they have. I believe they've been very quiet about it. That this is the hidden reason why everybody's kind of okay, you know, tiptoeing around Germany a little bit. Um, McCloy, in addition to ending up, of course, being the American High Commissioner for post-war Germany, well, what else does he end up on? Oddly enough, he ends up on the Warren Commission as, as one of the seven Warren Commissioners. So in other words, this guy, the, he represents that Sullivan and Cromwell crowd, as I like to call it, within the American deep state that had definite pro-German, uh, pro-Nazi sympathies during World War II. And his actions betoken it. Now, the reason this is significant is going back to the Madrid Circular. The Madrid Circular specifically mentions in ostensibly 1950, published in 1953, that the Nazis, in order to position key members within the post-war West German government, have been relying upon their contacts with the American High Commissioner, and they mention this McCloy by name. So in other words, they're attributing some sort of back channel goings on here with John J. McCloy. Oh, that is really interesting. That's scary. Yeah, he's featured in there. Yeah, he is. Well, his association with the Warren Commission is unusual, his placement there, and he's representing that kind of Wall Street fascist wing, basically. Uh -huh. Now, there is something about the Kennedys taking part in all these committees in the 50s, uh, you know, going after organized crime, and they certainly had ties to and supported Senator McCarthy, who ran these major anti-communist investigations that you cover in the book. Yes. And so with the Kennedys' keen insight and with their father's business connections, they understood that fascist influence brought over from World War II Germany. Mm -hmm. So... This affects their actions again when JFK becomes president and makes moves to limit the power of the CIA 
And you have an excellent book called uh, LBJ and the Conspiracy to Kill Kennedy. And you point out that this fascist influence that was residing in the CIA, uh, JFK posed a huge threat to that. And then oh, yeah. we see McCloy on the committee to investigate his assassination. So what does that tie over to this post-war Nazi influence and the JFK assassination? I think it's huge. Uh, in fact, as far as I know, I'm the only researcher out there that has been willing to address the Nazi and fascist angle of the Kennedy assassination. No one else wants to go there. Right. No one else wants to look at what is patently there in the record. Uh, Garrison ran across this, and even he didn't know what to make of it. Most of, most of the records that we have about this connection are coming out of Garrison's investigation. And even Garrison didn't know what to do with this. You know, Nazis, you know, fascists. And of course, this is Jim Garrison, who was the DA of New Orleans, who actually did an investigation on the JFK assassination and found all these interesting ties that you're talking about. And some of his uh, work and his research was popularized in the movie JFK by Oliver Stone. Yes. So let's go back to Kennedy, and I'm going to point out two things here. I'm going to point out what he was attempting to do to the CIA, and then I'm going to point out a couple of odd things about the assassination itself in this connection. When Kennedy issues, I think it's National Security Memorandum number 272, the one that, that Colonel Prouty used to talk about so much. When he issues this and, and is determined, in his words, to smash the CIA into a thousand pieces and take away the CIA's covert operations capability and give it back to the military, just take it away from the CIA entirely. What Kennedy's really done, if you go back to the deal that was made between Alan Dulles and Reinhard Galen, as far as the Nazis are concerned, what Kennedy is attacking is their umbrella under which they are allowed to function. Uh -huh. So he's taking away a base of power for them. And that in itself, if that, if that is motive enough, as most assassination researchers argue, for the CIA's potential involvement in this, the assassination, it certainly is also motivation for this post-war Nazi intelligence nexus to be involved in the assassination. Now, let's look at Oswald. Because what happens to Oswald? Well, we know the story. Oswald is a Marine at Atsugi Air Base in Japan, where he is given top secret access to the radar data about the U-2 flight, flights over the Soviet Union. He studies Russian, which according to some people, he speaks very fluently. And what is not mentioned, although it's in the Warren Commission's records, is that he is also heard speaking German. Oh, wow. Well, that is so bizarre. This is in the Warren report, but most people never, again, this is where assassination researchers have been so focused on mafia and CIA and bankers and, you know, all Cubans. They're overlooking other significant clues that go directly again to a potential Nazi international involvement here. And that is that Oswald is also heard speaking German. Mm -hmm. When his address book is found, he has the address of George Lincoln Rockwell and the phone number. Rockwell is, of course, at the time, the leader of the American Nazi Party. So what's this doing in a supposed communist sympathizer's book? When Oswald defects and goes to the Soviet Union, he ends up being placed by the, the Russians in a job in an electronics factory in Minsk, Belarusia, where he meets his wife, uh, Marina, who's the daughter of a Soviet GRU, military intelligence colonel, okay? Amazing. All right, now, let's look at this. That's quite a connection. That's quite a connection right there, all right? Now, let's look at this very carefully. Who had the human on-the-ground intelligence connections inside the Soviet Union to be able to get Oswald into a position like that and then get him out of the Soviet Union, number one, with money, 
Number two, with the daughter of a Soviet GRU colonel in tow, okay, who had the on-the-ground human intelligence contacts to be able to sheep dip Oswald and then run him inside the Soviet Union? It's not the CIA directly. It's Galen. And that's former Nazi general Richard Galen. Galen's network. It's his West German intelligence network. It's his West German intelligence network that has the capability to do this. It's not the CIA directly. Now, why is this important? Oswald, of course, comes back to this country. He ends up in Dallas, Texas, being introduced to the white Russian emigre community, Belorussia, where he's just come from, by who? By George de Morinschild. Yeah. Okay. Now, de Morinschild, most people think, is a CIA asset. I say baloney. Folks, you got to get with the program here. He's probably BND. He's probably German intelligence. Why? Because his last name used to be von Morinschild. Okay. So he's one of these Russian Germans that, that is brought into Russia under Catherine the Great. And on top of this, de Morinschild is the one introducing Oswald to people like Hunt and Murkison. All right? Right. And where do the Hunts and Murkisons have their private intelligence service connections, according to the research of Peter Dale Scott? Well, their connection is, guess what? West German intelligence and General Reinhard Galen. Oh, now that ties it together. That ties it together right there. So you have a German connection in the Kennedy assassination, a Nazi connection in the Kennedy assassination that no one wants to talk about. Well, when we come back, we're going to ask that question about why no one wants to talk about that link. We're going deep in the heart of the deep state, so stay with us. We'll be back. Go deeper with Dark Journalist. Subscribe now and you'll have access to the complete audio archives to download or stream at your convenience. Receive advanced updates and discounts on Dark Journalist events. Enjoy exclusive subscriber-only content. Go deeper with Dark Journalist. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special winter discount. Available for just $39 for one full year. Dark Journalist, the truth is never easy. And we are back for this final round of part one of our discussion with Dr. Joseph Farrell on his excellent new book, The Third Way, The Nazi International, European Union, and Corporate Fascism. It's a unique piece of work that can connect these dots in a variety of really powerful ways. Now, Joseph, why is it that this post-war Nazi connection to the JFK assassination is so important? Because it's there in the symbolism of the assassination. You can go online or get that documentary, Evidence of Revision, which is really a good one. Yes. Because it gives you the CBS, NBC, ABC news reporting of the assassination as it's happening. Mm -hmm. And the first thing, one of the things they're talking about over and over and over again is they found the rifle. Walter Cronkite, uh, we've been told it's a 7.65 Mauser, a uh, German rifle, over and over and over. And then later the story changes to a 6.5 Mannlicher Carcano, an Italian rifle. Golly, rifles from Axis countries, okay? <laughs> you know, I think, gee, there's a clue. Well, something that is significant in this context and which is covered in my documentary on this subject called Agent Oswald, the CIA Patsy, which you can view at darkjournalist.com, is the fact that Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig, one of the first people on the scene, reported that it was a 7.65 Mauser rifle. And so let's go to that clip and then we'll come back and you can tell us what it means. We're all aware that Oswald is supposed to have performed the shooting by using a Manlikar Carcano rifle, but what has been suppressed is that there was a different rifle found at the scene by an alert sheriff's deputy named Roger Craig. Craig's compelling testimony begins here. And uh, Boone was ahead of me by about eight feet. And there was a, there were a stack of boxes uh, just at the head of the stairwell going downstairs. And Boone looked over into it and said, here it is. Here's the rifle. So I immediately went over beside him and looked over, and there was a rifle. 
but we didn't touch it until Captain Fritz and Lieutenant Day from the ID department of the Dallas Police Department got there. Now, Captain Fritz was the chief of homicide. Lieutenant Day was from the Identification Bureau. They got there and uh, took some pictures of the rifle. And then uh, I believe Day pulled the rifle out and handed it to Captain Fritz, who held it up by the... Uh, had a strap on it. He held it up by the strap and asked if anyone knew what kind of rifle it was. Well, by this time, Deputy Constable Seymour Weitzman had joined us. And uh, Weitzman was a uh, gun buff. He had a sporting goods store at one time. He was very good at, with weapons. And he said, it looks like a Mauser. And he walked over to Fritz, and Captain Fritz was holding the rifle up in the air, and I was standing next to Weitzman, who was standing next to Fritz, and we weren't any more than six or eight inches from the rifle, and stamped right on the barrel of the rifle was 7.65 Mauser. And that's when Weitzman said, it is a Mauser, and pointed to the 7.65 Mauser stamp on the barrel. Craig's shocking testimony about the rifle being a different model than Oswald's Manlicher Carcano threatened to bring down the official version of events. He was soon fired from the police department on a pretext and found himself the target of a witness elimination program. Several attempts were made on his life and he became disabled. Finally, in May 1975, he was found with a shotgun blast to his chest. The ruling was suicide. And that is Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig's testimony there. Now, what does that tell us about what was behind the assassination? Hang on. There's one more thing about 7.65 Mausers you need to know. <laughs> All right. Go for <laughs> that it. That nobody wants to talk about. The Mauser issued to the German army was not a 7.65. Okay. The Mauser company made 7.65 for Argentina. Ah, Okay. <laughs> What does that tell you? Home of the post-war Nazi international. <laughs> Home of the post-war Nazi international. <laughs> Martin Borman and company, uh, you know, Ronald Richter with his fusion project, you know, all of that, right to Argentina. So you think that the message of this other rifle at the scene, because it certainly is an oddity even that it was there and it was quickly hushed up, but it's uh -huh. almost as if the plotters didn't even know it was going to be found. Yeah, Exactly. Someone is someone is planting clues in the symbolism of the rifles alone that you're dealing with the axis. Right. Okay, that's what you're dealing with. And I could go on and on for other Nazi connections to the whole thing. You know, you, you've you've got you've got uh, Oswald in New Orleans, Dr. Mary Sherman with David Ferry, and their connection to Dr. Alton Oxner, a native of my home state of South Dakota, I might add. And Dr. Alton Oxner, of course, the war on cancer, and he makes frequent trips to South America where he is uh, doing medical research. We're not told what kind, but one of his best patients just happens to be Juan Perón. So, yeah, well, <laughs> the know. ultimate protector of the fleeing Nazis after the war. Yeah, exactly. That is so fascinating. There's an explosive connection that you point out in your LBJ and the Conspiracy to Kill Kennedy book, and that is Walter Dornberger, who's a paperclip Nazi we brought over after the war, who hires a young engineer named Michael Payne while he's at Bell uh -huh. Aerospace and basically acts as his mentor, and he assigns him to Fort Worth, uh -huh. Texas to work at Bell Helicopter. And yep. then he and his wife, Ruth Payne, become the host family to... Lee and Marina Oswald, mm -hmm. when they returned from Russia to live in Dallas. Mm -hmm. Now, can you tell us here about General Dornberger? Well, General Dornberger was the German Army general that was in charge of the German rocket project at Peenemünde. All right? Right. And please note the pronunciation, everybody. It's Peenemünde, not Peenemünde, or, you know, I hear so much stuff. Um. It's Dornberger, in other words, that is heading von Braun and Obert and Strugholt and Arthur Rudolph and all of these Nazi rocket scientists that we also bring to this country, by the way. 
And Dornberger is one of the people that Von Braun, once he's over here, insists that the Americans bring over. So he is the cream of the Nazi crop. Yeah, he's the management guy. You know, this is the guy that coordinated it all, for, you know, in the early days. And Dornberger ends up, of course, at, at, as you say, at Bell Helicopter. Well, Dornberger, it's interesting that von Braun would insist on bringing this guy. He's not a scientist. He's an administrator. That's what he is. Mm -hmm. Now, why would you bring someone like this over? Well, as I point out in Roswell and the Reich, you, you have the American Army counterintelligence suddenly discovering that the Germans are reproducing the exact same command structure amongst themselves inside the United States that they had over in Adolf Hitler's Germany. The very same. They're in the same positions doing the same stuff. Unbelievable. You know, it's, it's just unreal. And Dornberger is such an interesting character because this direct tie, such a blatant tie that we have here with Payne and Oswald, and of course all of the evidence that damns Oswald in the public eye and that the Warren Commission uses comes out of the Payne household. That's right. So, you know, That's from right. backyard photos to his uh, letters to embassies and all that, this is such a fascinating connection, I think, and it really shows us where this assassination and cover-up is coming from. We'll talk off the record about another interesting connection I know about, but that's 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 okay. between you and me. Okay, good. I want to hear that. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's those off the record talks, folks, that are that are the really good ones. <laughs> So we've walked through one half of your research on this, uh, tying in this powerful mover and shaker, John J. McCloy, to CERN, and in turn, CERN to the post-war Nazi forces and the presence of that Nazi deep state in our own American political process, uh, taking a role in the JFK assassination and so on. So now we're on the road to revealing some deep ties to the Hadron Collider, advanced technology, and these secret breakaway deep state forces operating in a covert fashion. And as usual, we're just getting started. So uh, we'll end this episode. Thank you, Joseph. And please stick around. We'll, uh, we'll do part two. Certainly. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Well, you, you knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Thank you for joining me for this fascinating episode with Dr. Joseph P. Farrell on CERN, Paperclip Nazis, and the Cosmology Cartel. You can find more special reports, interviews, and documentaries at www.darkjournalist.com. You can also subscribe here to our YouTube channel for the latest videos. See you soon. Dark journalist will go there. The deepest issues, the hardest stories, the biggest secrets. The truth is never easy. With top guests like former assistant housing secretary Catherine Austin Fitz. Catherine, who is really behind this media censorship? And internet feeds go through satellites. Who controls the satellites? It's the Pentagon. Legendary investigator Graham Hancock. Uh, Graham, this cataclysm must have destroyed an advanced culture in our ancient past. Uh, it truly was an extinction level event. It was accompanied by massive animal extinctions. It was accompanied by huge and unexplained sea level rises and then a sudden plunge of global temperatures. Best selling author Jim Mars. Jim, don't these elite corporate owners need us around to buy their GMO food? Why would they want to depopulate? because they are eugenicists and they believe that they need to purify the human race. If that sounds like the Nazis, that's exactly what it is. Coast to Coast AM investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, how are we going to scale that wall of UFO secrecy? Humans themselves are bypassing, are beginning to dismiss all of the policies of denial and lies. Dark journalists will go there. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special winter discount available for just $39 for one full year. You'll not only receive access to the complete audio archives to stream or download at your convenience, you'll also get exclusive subscriber-only content and Dark Journalist event discounts. Sign up for our free newsletter to stay updated on the latest shows. Dark Journalist, let's get the real story in 2016. You know, we need dark journalists, so just keep doing what you're doing.